Good evening, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, Sacred Geography, and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum update. Friday, December 2nd, 8.30 p.m. Mountain Time, 2022. The seismic swarm at Taupo is continuing in earnest. But the big story, perfect start to the season. Snow is dumping on Tahoe with more on the way. Hey, hey. Shut up, Al. Get in your hole. Keep calm. It's boom time. Two inches an hour, double-digit incoming snow means avalanche watch in Colorado. And heavy snow coming to Tahoe. Who knew? Well, let's take a look at the snowfall analysis in the last 48 hours, and you can see some epic totals in the Sierras. Two feet over most areas. We've got two to three feet in areas of western Wyoming as well as Idaho and there is two to three feet coming for many of these areas. Now, most local highways reopen after closures in Idaho, but Idaho Highway 33 between Newdale and Tetonia is still closed. Highway 20, U.S. Highway 26, Highway 47 and 32, as well as 87 have all reopened, but that is tentative because they may reclose. As yesterday, Greenland gained enough mass to bury Central Park under 9,000 feet of ice. And in fact, Antarctica's coldest month of November since records began. And China's big freeze intensifies Beijing's lowest November tense since 1970. Grand solar minimum much? Here's that spike yesterday. Take a look at that. Eight gigatons of ice early in the season of pleasing. Now, a giant rogue wave hit Antarctica-bound cruise ship, leaving one dead and four injured as we come over to the snowfall totals, which are looking pretty heavy. So let's walk this through. By tomorrow, Colorado's going to be hit by major snows, and then the heavy snow is going to be moving into the Pacific Northwest and the Sierras and moving north. Take a look at that pattern. Up to four feet of snow will fall in just the next four days in the central Sierras. And that is an epic forecast that will not be outdone by the continuing snowfall totals that will completely obliterate the north through December. Now let's take a look at the west side snow tell. Current month-to-date precipitation percent, 3,800% in Idaho in the south. 3,600%, 24.50, ridiculous numbers in Idaho. There is a deficit in Washington State, but that is their fate. They're about to get buried in a flurry of activity. Four to seven feet of snow through December 18th for Washington State. And it is going to definitely add insult to injury as the snow piles up in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, I don't know. Wyoming, hello, could be seeing six to eight feet of snow in the high elevations. It is a December to remember. Snow continues for the west and northern plains, gusty winds, and fire weather for the central and southern plains. A strong cold front continues to push across western U.S. today with a storm developing when it reaches the central plains. Heavy snow will continue across the intermontane west and Rocky Mountains and spread into the northern plains and upper Midwest. Gusty and high winds and critical fire weather conditions are expected for the southern and central plains today. And you can see the winter storm watches and warnings and those gusts all located on the national map. Click on your county for more information. Now, extreme cold warning smothers most of Alberta. Yeah, it's going to get cold up there. Cold warnings blanket most of Alberta with temps hitting minus 40 C. Hello. It's not even winter. As we come over, <laughs> well, it's winter for some people, but we don't celebrate winter till the 21st here in the U.S. Seismic update, no quakes of note. The whole continent, the whole world is looking, well, quite spectacular, except for Iceland. The whole country, pretty much the Reykjanes Ridge is at a lull, and let's go just pull that up here real quick to take a look at the seismicity on the ridge where all of the eruptive activity has happened in the last several years. Really nothing going on anywhere. But if we look over at a hole, we still have this region in question over two months of amazing activity pumping up 
from the Vatna Yoko Glacier, just north of there near uh, Ashja, just east and north of Ashja. This tectonic event is what they're calling it. It's certainly not tectonic. There's a volcano right underneath of all these dots called Hildebreid, which hasn't erupted for a very long time. But it's our supposition that there could be something afoot in Iceland that we are not aware about, meaning there is no historical information for eruptions at this region, but something is afoot at this region. Similar to the uptick at Mauna Loa, which we predicted would blow up, and it did. Now, Death Valley's Ubehibi Kraber crater reveals volcanic hazard areas are underestimated, and these are freomagmatic, similar to the Yellowstone caldera. But when magma bubbles up towards Earth's surface and meets the groundwater, steam and pressure builds, and sometimes bursting into eruptions that spew currents of hot ash, potentially burning and asphyxiating people and burying nearby cities. Take, for example, similar ash currents that formed during eruptions at Mount Vesuvius, which were responsible for many of the fatalities in the city of Pompeii around 79 CE. Well, similar events have happened in California. These so-called freomagmatic eruptions do not just occur at large mountainous volcanoes like Vesuvius. They can also occur at distributed volcanic fields, where the volcanic activity is spread out over a wider, more unassuming area. And the eruptions leave behind craters called Mars. While only a handful of Mar-forming freomagmatic eruptions have occurred throughout recorded history, geologists can estimate the hazardous areas around future Mar-forming eruptions by examining how far these volcanic deposits extend from the crater. Well, and they did just that. Deposits produced by currents of hot ash called pyroclastic surges extend one to six kilometers, or about a mile to four miles from most craters suggesting that pyroclastic surges only travel that far from an eruption site. However, <laughs> new data is coming in, and they suggest that these distances may be an underestimate, according to a new study published in the Geophysical Research Letters. Now, the study led by the University of Buffalo Professor, Professor Greg Valentine, a friend of mine, increases the range of pyroclastic surge runout to 10 to 15 kilometers. This is doubling, almost tripling, the distance that was once thought to occur, which is putting many more people in harm's way around the Mono Craters area of California, the Inyo Craters, and, well, many other regions, including the Ubihidi Craters. <laughs> so, heads up, if you're in the Vol... Uh, Yellowstone area, you could be burned. Now, lava from Mauna Loa is crawling towards a busy highway, and they may want to change the direction of the lava. But in my opinion, that is kind of stupid. Lava flows from Fisher 3 is slowed down by reaching a flat area around 7,000 feet, which is good news, because it now is going to take days to reach the highway. And we're talking about Saddle Road. Here is the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory daily update. The Northeast Rift Zone eruption of Mauna Loa continues with one active fissure, Fissure 3, feeding a lava flow down slope. Fissure 4 is sluggish, and Fissure 1 and 2 are no longer active. Fissure 3 is generating a lava flow traveling to the north towards Daniel K. Inu, Highway, Saddle Road, that has reached relatively flatter ground and slowed down significantly, barely moving. Now, over the past 24 hours, the lava flow has advanced at a rate of just 150 feet per hour. As of 7 a.m. Hilo Standard Time, this morning, the lava front was just 2.7 miles from Daniel K. Inu Highway, so it's probably just two miles away now. Now, Fisher Fork continues to be active, but with very little eruptive activity observed this morning, and I expect more fissures to open up lower down as the volcano progresses. Advance rates may be highly variable over the coming days and weeks due to the way lava is in place on flat ground. 
On flat ground, lava flows spread out and inflate. Individual lobes may advance quickly and then stall. Additionally, breakouts may occur if lava channels get clogged upslope and may lead to catastrophic outbursts that then cover the road. There are, in fact, many variables at play, and both the direction and timing of flow advance are expected to change over the periods of hours or days. So stay tuned for more updates. Here you can see the position at 12.30 p.m. of the lava flow front near the road here, and you can see how wide it's getting. This allows for more damming and outbursts to occur, so we're going to see a fanning out of this lava flank in the near future. Here we are at the live stream. We're looking here at two pineapples, and it's, it's not dark, so there's nothing really spectacular to show, so come back later. But you can see here that main fissure, number three, fountaining quite spectacularly and just as active as it ever was. So there is no indication that this eruption is shutting down anytime soon. As we continue to monitor the progress. Now, is there a way to stop a lava flow? Officials are discussing diversion amid the Mauna Loa eruption. And Iceland has used diversion tactics. They were even discussing it at La Palma. But is it worth it? Or should we just let nature run its course? Well, hopefully nature doesn't run its course at Taupo Volcano in New Zealand, one of the most dangerous volcanoes on Earth, which hasn't erupted in any spectacular fashion for over 26,000 years. But strong earthquakes and an ongoing seismic swarm are raising eyebrows. Yes, a mighty 5.6 earthquake occurred beneath Lake Taupo on the 30th of November. The quake generated ground movement detected by GNSS instruments installed around the lake and also created a tsunami. The maximum accumulated horizontal deformation reached 100 millimeters at Horomontagi Reef. Numerous aftershocks have been registered, in fact, thousands. But they're not saying that here. The event is linked to an ongoing seismic unrest that began in May of 2022. The earthquake has been widely felt, causing minor damage and a small tsunami on the lake. Nevertheless, volcanic alert level remains at 1. And we know what happened on White's Island when they kept it at 1. People died. So is New Zealand doing the same thing here with Taupo? It's anyone's guess. But there are certainly hundreds of thousands, if not millions of more people at risk in this region. So. It's anyone's guess if the seismologists are actually warning what they should be warning. Because governments have the power to suppress information and to prevent people from evacuating. Which leads... Well, to catastrophes. Now, experts are assessing earthquake-related lake wave activity that occurred as a result of the M5.6 quake. It caused a run-up along the lakeshore between Warewaka Point and Taupo Township. The wave action is likely the result of a lake-based tsunami. However, we are unsure what has generated it. Well, maybe... Taupo Volcano, you schmucks. Hello. <laughs> These people. Now you can see there's been a rapid uptick in the last few minutes of earthquake activity. So this is, the, the seismic swarm had been depleting and many people were saying, oh, it's ending. No, it isn't. It's just re-energized. And in fact, there are lots of quakes occurring. Let's just refresh this. Over 100 quakes in the last 24 hours. And if we go out seven days, you don't want to see there's over a thousand quakes in this area. So this is one of the highest levels ever recorded since the swarm began. And it's increasing because we've been watching it. So stay tuned for more boom at Taupo. Space weather news update. The sun is blank. We've got some sunspots coming in finally on the flank. So Solar Max actually has sunspots, which is good news. 
Now the high-speed solar wind stream and periods of minor G1 geomagnetic storming in the past several days was all thanks to these coronal holes, 51 especially, turning away from Earth. Now the solar wind is still moving past Earth around 600 kilometers per second, but is expected to gradually weaken over the next few days. The good news is that another coronal hole, 53, that's in a similar location and size will begin to face Earth early next week. And this means another high speed stream and possible storming could be right around the corner. Plus, we have a large sunspot, <laughs> which will be facing Earth at the same time, active region 3153, which right now is beta delta, which means we have a 5% X-flare possibility. So we have some serious conditions developing on our sun, which we need to monitor. So stay tuned for the boom from AR3153 as it turns towards Earth. Now, emergency water releases are going on into the Great Salt Lake to preserve it because it's a climate catastrophe. Yes, we agree, Al. Now go to bed. And maybe we'll give you some bun cake. He's clueless. And so are all the mainstream scientists and reporters that are writing shit like this. Emergency water releases going into the Great Salt Lake. Didn't they get the memo? The Great Salt Lake is a dried up Lake Bonneville. The lake once covered almost one third of Utah after the melting of the glaciers at the end of the last ice age, the catastrophic ending of the ice age. Lake Bonneville formed, and the Great Salt Lake is just a puddle of the remnant lake. The Great Salt Lake is not a lake. It's the remnant of Lake Bonneville, and no one cares about it except people alive now that are clueless about what it means. It's not a natural formation on Earth. It's not something we need to preserve or will stay here. It's going to dry up. It's a puddle. But I do muddle about the facts of science and normalcy. Now, 600 rock carvings found by Clever Inquiry and Torchlight are not nonsense, and they will not dry up. Now, three friends in Norway have a remarkable way of spending their spare time, and they uncovered some amazing amounts of petroglyphs in their home state. And I will leave you links to this because this article, because it's a short article. They don't really tell you much. Now, CT scans of toothed bird fossils lead to draw-dropping discovery. And what they found was that there were birds right before the KT boundary, before the extinction of the dinosaurs, that had palettes that move like modern birds. And they didn't know that these existed at that time. The toothy animal was discovered in, 19, in the 1990s by an amateur fossil collector at a quarry in Belgium and dates to 66.7 million years ago, right before the asteroid hit Chicksa Club. Now, while the fossil was first described in a study 20 years ago, researchers re-examine the specimen and say they have made an unexpected discovery. Yeah, they were wrong. <laughs> the animal, in fact, had a mobile palate. Now, if you imagine how we open our mouths, the only thing we're able to do is move our lower jaw. Our upper jaw is totally fused to our skull. It's completely immobile. Non-avian dinosaurs, including tyrannosaurs, also had a fused palate, as do a small number of modern birds, such as ostriches and cassowaries. But in contrast, 
the vast majority of modern birds, including chickens, ducks, and parrots, are able to move both the upper and lower jaw independently from the rest of the skull and each other. And this allows them to grind up tiny seeds and other schmutz, which allowed them to make it through the cosmic catastrophe of the end of the dinosaurs and the impact 65 million years ago. So now you know. The reasons birds lived and dinosaurs ended was because of the movable palate, which you and I don't have. So we may be about to go extinct. Now Reno's airport makes changes to the runway due to Earth's magnetic field shifting. Hello! Someone got the memo. Shut up, Al! Global warming has nothing to do with the magnetic excursion, you schmuck. Sorry about that. Now, the Earth's magnetic field is shifting rapidly. And according to these authors, the magnetic north is always moving. But it hasn't moved in a fashion it has in recent history. So, because an airport has to move its runways due to the magnetic field shifting, should make you realize how fast the Earth's magnetic pole is shifting. Now, shouldn't it? Massive eruption from an icy volcanic comet may reveal that astrophysicists are complete idiots. Yeah, they actually talk about volcanoes erupting on this comet, which we now have proven is completely non-correct. There are no volcanoes on comets. Comets are pieces of terrestrial material from planets that have blown into space and now are electric. And this is the most electric comet in space, which is discharging plasma from its electrical field and not from a single volcano. So live science, you are not science. You are completely full of shit and you can suck it. Two minerals never seen before in nature were discovered on an asteroid that fell to Earth. And the good news is that geologists looked at this in thin section and they know that these are not minerals we know of because they're not minerals we know of. Unlike other scientific endeavors which make up fairy tales like the plasma physicist and the astrophysicist that claim that comets have volcanic eruptions which is 100% false. Well, when you actually have observational information like this thin section of a mineral that has never been described on Earth, you know it's a new mineral. And a laolite, as well as, what's the other one? We have two new minerals that were just discovered. Bear with me. Okay, it's a laolite, and they misspelled it here. There should be another L after the A. And elkinstantonite. Elkinstantonite and a laolite. And here you can say a laolite. And I believe there's elkinstantonite here. These are all under thin section on a petrographic microscope, and they cannot be any other mineral than the one is being described. Which is the beauty of empirical science. When you find something that has never been seen and you're seeing it, you know it's a new thing. Ding, ding. Just like Elon Musk, who spent $46 billion of his own money to reveal the things that didn't make sense. Ding, ding. In fact, tonight he revealed the interference in elections with the dump of the Twitter files that we have on our Twitter page at Diamond the Dave at Diamond the Dave Oppenheimer Ranch Project can be found on Twitter at Diamond the Dave at Diamond the Dave if you didn't hear it I don't know why you're there or you're not there we need 4,000 followers by the end of this video or we're just a schmidio now we've been sitting at 9,600 followers for five years and only in the last Two months has this number increased. Thank you, Elon. 
and let's get this up to 5,000 tonight. Let's do it. Let's make a movement and not a bowel movement. Now, who is Cocaine Bear? Do tell. And why is everyone on the internet, including Elon Musk, talking about him? Well, that was old news. That was two days ago. But if you don't know about Cocaine Bear, you should. In fact, back in like 1987, um, some smuggling operation dumped some cocaine from the air and it landed in like Chattahoochee, Tennessee or something and a bear ate it. And they found that bear after he ate the cocaine and he was dead in probably four hours. And so the powers that be took that tidbit of information and extrapolated it into a two-hour movie, which is totally hilarious. And you should watch at least the trailer. And that's a boom to knowledge. Proper prior planning prevents piss-poor performance. I hope you got something out of the video. Please become a, a tweeter. Subscribe over to our Twitter and blow this up. This is the most important social media platform in modern history, in my opinion, at this time. And please come subscribe and follow us at Diamond the Dave. If not, become a Patreon. Support the work we do. Share this video and be a hero. We love you. And be safe. And that's a boom. Mm.